gaps in healthcare systems uh, that pertain to how healthcare delivery is done uh, within the healthcare system and how our patients, our end users are affected by it and how they face those gaps and how can we bridge some of those gaps through um, research. Um, and today I'll talk about my current research, um, which is on improving pediatric hypertension detection. Um, and I'm using some methodologies with implementation science, which I'll talk about. Um, I first want to set the background of why I got interested in this. Um, it mainly came from just being very clinically busy and seeing this problem over and over again. Um, you may know this, that high blood pressure is more common than you might think. Up to 5% of children actually have confirmed hypertension. And hypertension in childhood leads to hypertension in adulthood and can cause organ damage, um, your brain, kidneys, heart, um, as we age. But only less than 25% of children are actually diagnosed. So it's a much larger kind of health system problem. Uh, and there are a multitude of reasons for that. Um, Blood pressures are being measured consistently in primary care, but uh, practices are not, not following the management recommendations. And even after getting a diagnosis, 60% of patients are not receiving any intervention or are not being followed appropriately. Um, when I started to kind of dig deeper into this uh, at Nemours, I found that out of our initial sort of preliminary data assessment, um, we looked at uh, almost 90,000 kids and the overall prevalence for hypertension is anywhere from three to five percent, but the diagnostic code usage within our system was 0.9 percent. And when we looked at those kids who had hypertension, um, 75 percent of those uh, patients were not being followed within a year after their initial diagnosis. Um, in addition to that, you need at least three blood pressure measurements to make a diagnosis. So patients need to be followed very closely. Uh, so that's when I started to kind of work on this and um, partnered with the pediatricians, the VBSO team, and subspecialists to kind of really think about what do I do? How do I go about fixing this? So the first thing I wanted to do is really understand the context of why this is happening. Um, and when I started to kind of think about that, that led me to thinking about this sort of science to practice gap. Um, it takes about two decades for any kind of science to get into the real world. Um, and one way to fix that is to develop a learning health system. So, um, and I'll sort of talk a little bit about that. A learning health system is basically um, a research system that engages with the clients, caregivers, or communities, um, and is also partnering with the primary care teams, clinicians, and providers, and also health system leaders and other researchers and funders. And the main goal is to identify questions and opportunities for change, and then use data, research, and evidence to answer some of those questions, and then implement improvements and spread those learnings within the system. So I, I would like to think of this as like a co-production of healthcare where everyone kind of comes together, you understand the context of how the problem is happening, and then you devise the strategies to fix the problem. So then I applied for a K-12 through PeedsNet, um, and I did this research uh, over the last two years. And the whole goal was for me to understand the context of why this problem is happening. Um, and one of the things that we learned through this research is that um, when parents, when we interviewed parents and talked to pediatricians, parents knew a lot about hypertension based on their own family experiences, based on their own personal history. Lots of uh, parents had hypertension, were on medications. Um, and our health system also was influencing the way parents thought about hypertension. So providers obviously had a bunch of other things going on. They had competing factors and hypertension wasn't quite a priority overall. Uh, when high blood pressure was recognized in clinics, we were attributing that to situational factors like white coat syndrome or anxiety. Um, and both uh, providers uh, and clinicians had reservations and parents had reservations around medication use in pediatrics, um, specifically for hypertension. So um, parents knew about hypertension, but there was this overall lack of concern when high blood pressure was being recognized in clinic. Uh, and then families uh, did not want medications for their child. And that sort of led to parents not really asking a lot of questions during visits and then not following up on hypertension management um, recommendations by the provider. So uh, what I learned through this experience is this context is key. So you have to understand where people are coming from, why this problem is happening uh, from like on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to that, uh, we've worked on sort of 
looking at some of the barriers and um, challenges and what are the recommendations of the end users on how to fix this problem. So we started by looking at some of the patient related issues and uh, when we talk to families, we pur purposely try to um, include um, diverse families into our uh, cohort so that we understand some of their perspectives as well. And they talked uh, a lot about social terms of health factors that impact, uh, you know, re repeat clinic visits that are necessary to get to a diagnosis. And families talked about how they're losing money just basically by coming back and back again and again for appointments because they have to leave work for that. The cost of um, care was also a key factor. Uh, they had um, significant copays. Language barriers was another key uh, problem for Spanish speaking families. They said that when in person interpreters are not being used, they have a hard time asking questions and openly discussing these things with the providers. Um, insurance was another factor. Uh, family members had uh, fluctuating insurances and changes in insurance because of their job. Transportation, so bringing the kid from uh, leaving work, bringing the kid uh, from school, all of those factors were uh, playing a key role in why parents weren't coming back. Uh, in addition to that, there were scheduling issues, um, just having a hard time trying to get the appointment scheduled. And then as uh, I sort of alluded to, just the discussion that was happening in clinic uh, was limited around like, you need to come back, this is why you need to come back, why hypertension is important to address. Um, and then from a health system uh, challenge issues, um, the lack of resources to address some of these social terms of health factors and, uh, and in addition that, that uh, pediatricians are busy, they get 15 minutes to do a multitude of things. Um, so time constraints was a big factor and then staff shortages to get this done. Um, and then there were more specific health system issues around EMR usage and uh, care coordination. And some of the sort of final recommendations that came from combining all this data from the parents and the uh, providers were to increase the communication and education that happens in clinic, uh, make scheduling easier and offer more telehealth opportunities, um, having online tools for education and uh, scheduling, um, care coordination to help track some of this stuff, especially to get to a diagnosis with three blood pressures. And then one of the more kind of important things that the families and providers advocated for was, can we do this outside of the clinic? And uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One was the fact that uh, no one was trusting the blood pressure when it got measured and it was high and everyone wanted like more blood pressures done outside of the confines of the clinic to get this done. And in clinical practice, for uh, those of you uh, who are not clinical, um, when you're doing three blood pressures, uh, there's multiple recommendations that one can make. One, you can say, oh, can you get this done in school by the school nurse? Or um, you can sometimes do an ambulatory blood pressure monitor so that you know you can get data at home, um, or you can bring the kid back to clinic. Uh, but the recommendation overall was to, can we get the blood pressure done outside of the clinic? So that's sort of what led to um, my next uh, project or what I'm working on right now is to uh, think about like schools as an alternative uh, to getting that blood pressure done um, and sort of combining the school health infrastructure with the healthcare system and make it sort of more seamless and understanding some of the context around that. Um, so schools are an um, accessible and uh, equitable place because they offer uh, health to diverse uh, children who may not be coming into the routine healthcare systems. And they have proven to be uh, good for uh, certain chronic diseases such as asthma or obesity. Um, and mental health, and they have a potential to help with hypertension detection because school nurses are, are already intertwined with working with the healthcare system. They just don't have like a formative, you know, pathway uh, as of right now, but this is happening as a uh, best uh, practice already. And then there's an, a recent survey that was done of school nurses across the nation uh, to understand some of the ways that they're um, addressing hypertension. And uh, I think more than 80% of school nurses said that they are routinely measuring blood pressures and they would be um, more excited to incorporate more cardiovascular disease prevention into their work. Um, so that's sort of what led to my sort of thinking about how do I device this into a study and my um, K23 mentor uh, uh, research uh, award that I've been thinking. And um, I think the skill sets that I need are uh, to um, enhance this work by adding more implementation science methodologies, 
having the community voice throughout the whole uh, project so that I understand the context from different stakeholders. So community-based participatory research principles was an important objective for me. And then um, continuing on the line of health equity to make sure I um, address um, any issues that come up uh, based on diverse family perspectives. And then to get this done on the ground, I will have to eventually design a clinical trial. So that's one of my goals. And then, um, of course, grantsmanship and scholarly productivity as I move along in my research. So currently I'm um, applying for the NIHK 23 and, um, in February. And the whole um, overall goal is to leverage schools for hypertension detection using implementation science and community-based participatory research frameworks. Um, and the goal is to develop tailored, scalable strategies to improve hypertension detection. And this work is going to be guided by a community advisory board, which I'll show you uh, in a second. The first aim is to identify barriers and facilitators to school-based hypertension detection. I'm going to use implementation science frameworks to devise the um, questions, and we'll do qualitative interviews of um, the school nurses, nurse practitioners, pediatricians, um, and then families as well. And AIM2 will uh, reconvene to develop a toolkit of implementation strategies, again, using implementation science methodologies. Um, and in AIM3, we'll um, test out their feasibility and acceptability of the strategies by showing them to the end users. Um, so my primary mentor is Anne Kazak, and I have some additional mentors that I've recruited um, that have expertise in all of my learning objectives. Um, so CBPR, um, health equity and school-based health, implementation science, and then clinical trial design. Uh, in addition, I'm, uh, I have some uh, mentors who I've worked with uh, for a while now um, who are more geared towards preventive cardiology. And then we've uh, uh, developed this community advisory board so that uh, we have representation from uh, each of the main parties who are going to be involved in uh, getting this done on the ground. So uh, you had Santiago, you, um, a lot of you may know her. Um, then Catherine McDaniel is the school-based uh, health uh, center uh, lead from the Moors. And uh, Denise is her sort of counterpart. Uh, Denise Buffin is the Delaware School Nursing Association president. Uh, and then Jonathan Miller, as many of you know, is um, uh, the chief of pediatrics. And then Omar Khan is from Christiana Care, who's going to represent Christiana's uh, school based health centers as well. And then I'm going to consult the Promise Corps as I move along in this. Um, this is sort of what the overall plan looks like. So we'll first um, uh, develop the community advisory board. And I apologize for the busy slide. Um, and we'll start meeting quarterly, and then uh, there are some CBPR principle-based assessments to make sure everyone's voice is heard. That will uh, happen throughout the five years. Um, we'll conduct AIM-1, which is interviews and um, getting through the transcript coding and um, uh, showing them to the CAB over the first year and a half. And then AIM-2, we will uh, develop the toolkit of strategies through virtual meetings and then an in-person workshop, again, using some of the implementation science frameworks. Um, and that's throughout the year two, year three. And then for um, AIM-3, which is to measure our feasibility and acceptability, we'll start that in year four uh, into year five, and then I'll start preparing my R01 uh, to uh, develop a implementation science-based uh, hybrid clinical effectiveness and implementation trial. So these are all the slides that I have, and I'm happy to take any questions people have. 